Okay, so now we're live. And this is so <laughs> special to be here with you. Oh my gosh. Thank you. <laughs> so here we are. <clears throat> I'm Laura Jane, if you don't know me. And this is my dear friend and a big mentor and influence of mm -hmm. mine, Tracy Roberts. <laughs> You're so sweet. Most days I'm just trying to mentor myself. <laughs> well, yeah, it just turned out that you have had such an influence on me. And so, yeah, I just knew I did want to start this with sharing that because you're someone that I'm getting to talk to who has had such a personal influence on me and are coming to your play programs before you even took over directing at the preschool and mm -hmm. then being with you and part of the preschool uh co-op nursery school right that you amazingly created and facilitated we, yeah we learned i learned so much from you like i was so importantly changed by my time being around you and then the also the ways that you would educate us and then that you were even willing to be edgy about that <laughs> right mm -hmm. like, uh piss off the parents for the sake definitely of willing to be edgy in my life <laughs> Yeah. So you, oh my gosh. Yeah. So I'm just, I thank you. It's yeah, mutual. How much we've been affected by you and that yeah, I feel like my kids being part of your programs have become such great problem solvers and um, just had such a different experience being in community and even with expressing themselves because of like what mm -hmm. we've learned from you and they got to practice. <laughs> right. You. And, yeah. So yeah. again, thank you. I love to keep Well, it's, a, it's definitely a mutual experience and I learn just as much from the parents and the children every day as, as hopefully they, you're saying they learn from me. So I just try to keep that mentality always always in my head is that I am never fully arrived and I'm always learning and always growing. And, you know, the person that I shared my, one of my major mentors in my life that I share all the time with my parents is Bev Foz. And she was just, you know, she was always saying that, you know, if you ever stop learning and growing, then you might as well just die. Mm. So I constantly want to be learning and growing. And this year has been a great opportunity for that, huh? <laughs> like just uh. to, Right. learn and grow and yeah just be challenged and even triggered as you were saying in one of your earlier little talks you know um and and what that teaches us about ourselves so right and like i feel like you're someone who helped me see so clearly how our kids are learning so much from our example <clears throat> even beyond you know what we're actually saying to them it's like how we're saying it to them and then how we're just being with ourselves and our own lives. Mm -hmm. So that's interesting yeah. to consider right now. <laughs> it's super important to remember and yet super hard to live up to every single day, I think, um, because they are imitative beings. And especially in the early years, you know, birth through age seven is young, young children and the age that I primarily work with. Um, so yeah, they're imitative by nature and, and they, they follow their will and they have lack of impulse control and all of those kinds of things. So they just do whatever it is they see. And, um, and we're all kind of there. I know a lot of people who are really losing it and, and it's hard. It's hard to hold that constant modeling aspect for young children when we are struggling. So, you know, a lot of it has to do with taking time for ourselves so that we can go back and be in the presence of our children and give them something to model. Right. And you know what? I feel like you were someone in my life bringing that up with me back when my, when Casey was like two, who's now 19, that you <laughs> would kind of remind me that you could even see that as an important part of being an educator and working with families that you were there reminding parents how that was going to be important for us to show up for our kids like we want to. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I really love that yeah. you've always, I feel like been sharing that but it's um yeah it's like extra challenging right now as we want I think, to be perfect <laughs> yeah <laughs> i think i think that's definitely the difference is that back then it was a lot easier to do because i was 26 and i didn't have any children <laughs> you know so um yeah yeah there really was something to wait till you have children you know and <laughs> and while my ideals for young children and my 
philosophy of how to work with them didn't change, which was a lot of what was said to me was that that stuff would change. Mm -hmm, right. I got a perspective on how hard it is, mm -hmm. just how hard it is. And especially with, a you know, more than one young child or even just one young child every day who needs you constantly um, to provide for them in every way, emotionally, spiritually, physically. Um, it is it is just the, the compassion that comes with actually having a child and going through that yeah. and doing it twice, you know, um, is just so much more because I have children now, you know, um, so yeah. there's a, there's a, you know, and they're 11 and eight now, but gosh, I thought becoming a parent would be the easiest thing in the world because I just dealt with, you know, 12 to 15 children a day. So how could one really rock my world? You know? uh -huh. um, but the experience of a teacher is that it's temporary three to four hours and then you go home. Uh, and the experience of a parent is 24 hours a day and you go home and you try to take care of yourself in that time as well. And you have to listen to the news and you have to process the news. And right now that's a big thing. And, you know, you don't have to do those things, but right now with changing our changing world, it's almost impossible not to experience some of what's going on in the world and then having to process that for our own mental health and then try to, decide whether this is something that developmentally we need to explain to our children or not, you know? And yes. Yes. Cause I remember that you were, you always had a, a great um, way of expressing how maybe it's helpful for our kids. If we only share with them as much as they seem ready for, or what they're asking about. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. really interesting to consider right now too. Yeah. Right? Yeah. How have you been handling that with your kids? If you don't mind my asking with like the COVID and the other things going on. Mm -hmm. and how much you're talking about things. I mean, and with your elder, Elijah, he's 11 now, you said. So that's, yeah, yeah that's pretty. Right. Mature. And I think it's it's different depending on how you're, you know, definitely my kids are 11 and 8. And so they're, they're you know, leaving that early childhood phrase, phase, sorry. Um, and, and then I've been supporting parents through all of this in how to speak to their two, three, four, five, six-year-olds through all of this, which is yes. a slightly different thing, right? That makes sense. So it would be very different. Yeah. And that you're now in a new age bracket with mm -hmm. your like learning. <laughs> even, yeah. more, like, even though I know you've worked with kids, like some of the <laughs> no. kids you've nannied and been in their lives for through these yeah. ages and stages. Yeah. It's right. Right. I still feel completely lost. Uh -huh. I, right. I always feel like I have it 100% in early childhood and then just, I just feel lost, but you know, it, it's different. So with, with the older kids, uh, they hear our conversations, right? They and that is is super important to be aware of at any age that they're hearing the conversations that are being had between the other adults in the household. Yeah, um, right. and and to be conscious of when you have those conversations because mm -hmm. you know it it's um, it's important. It's important for them to realize that the adults sort of have this, it's their job to take care of this situation, you know, and that, that the young children cannot really be burdened with the responsibility for taking care of their own health, of their own um, schooling, of their own lives, of their, you know, being outdoors versus indoors, wearing a mask, not wearing a mask, all of those kinds of things need to um, be handled by the adults in the world because we are their safe place. We are the place that they go to, to, um, to feel secure and especially in early childhood. So those conversations are going to look really different with my 11 year old than they're going to look with a two year old, you know, and, um, you know, for most of them, I do, like you had alluded to, I do basically go off of, uh, what are they asking you? You know, what are they, what questions are they asking and remembering to answer that with just what they're asking and not give any more information that could maybe overload them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if, if the question is what is COVID, you don't have to go into a, you know, five hour discussion about all the things that we may possibly know that COVID is, it could just simply be, you know, it's a virus and, you know, we're doing washing our hands and making sure we're safe, you know, something along those lines. Um, but really portraying that we have this situation, that we're figuring the situation out and it isn't really their job to worry about it. We've got it under control because uh -huh. they really 
do need to feel like they have a safe place to go. And I think because the adults are so scattered and we don't know anything about this virus, and yeah. we don't, it's a lot harder of a place to get to. So just being aware of that is what I was trying to guide my parents through and um, trying to keep as much consistency in their lives as possible, given that everything is shut down. Ah, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Um, Cause I know you're really in touch with how like a, cause I know this seems like it comes from some of your Waldorf. I know Waldorf talks about like the rhythm of your mm -hmm. weeks and your days versus maybe not a schedule, but like a having, finding a rhythm. Right. And yeah, is that kind of some of what you're, you're referring to is keeping yeah. those rhythms going and those, rituals or just yeah some of the things that have been consistent for family mm -hmm. life yeah i mean we had to sort of all shut down right so yeah in the beginning you know it was right before our spring break so children are used to a short break from school they're used to not going for a while whether it's you know winter break or summer or that kind of thing and so they don't seem to they didn't seem to notice much you know the little kids and um, and we did take a spring break. And then after that, we returned with things like, you know, deliveries to their door, or audio stories and um, a huge support base for the parents. We basically transformed from being teachers of children to being teachers of parents during this time and passing out a weekly newsletter with songs and stories and that they could read to their children and tips on on how to handle little kids home all day long, you know, and um and, and this what is kind all of part of your school? Um, forest school, Tracy. Is this right. like an extension of what you've been doing even more live and in person? This is some of what you're doing now with the parents, right. families. Oh my gosh, amazing. Right. Do you right. have room yeah. for other families if they're interested as they're listening to this? Room in our school? <laughs> um, yeah, or to like no. be a part yeah. of your programs or to get any of this. Um, yeah, I mean, input? they can definitely they can definitely visit our my you know our website for my current business, which is Acorn Village. Org. Um, right now, the school is beyond full. Yeah, it's got a huge waiting list, which is, you know, I say that, and a lot of people are like, "What a good problem to have!" And it it definitely is business wise. Um, but you know, it's it's a little bit sad because in the area that I live, I am the only school that's open and not uh -huh. doing. Online and you're doing. Work. Are you back to doing outdoor classes? Like so, you already, that was your program. For COVID, right? It was outdoor right. classes with young children. Yeah, so we're a forest school, so we're completely outdoors. We don't have any indoor facilities. And, you know, that the nature is a huge healing aspect and it's a huge, beautiful um, resource for learning uh, naturally. And so that I sort of took all my philosophies that we experienced at the co op and put, put them out on the outdoors and realized that this was sort of always my goal to be out there um, and um so unfortunately fortunately we are getting we over the summer it was like five phone calls a day so we went from having um two preschool classes which were relatively full every year to our new kindergarten program and they're both mixed age so when i say kindergarten it's like five to eight year olds okay. um and now all three are full with a waiting list um okay. and it's it, it's literally was the f like third year of the kindergarten program. So it was filling slowly, but uh, I, I, I did just have, you know, five contacts a day and people just begging me to help them with something for their child, for some social interaction uh, for them to be outside because they felt safer because of the virus. Uh -huh. um, and, or they just didn't want to go back. They didn't want their kindergarten. Huh. She's frozen for a moment. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a big waiting list right now, um, but we're still touring people. And, you know, I have a few families who have you know, like immune compromised um, family members and are staying home this year, but we're still sending them what we do and trying to support them to be doing the things we're doing, but in person, you know, because it yeah. really it really doesn't take, I kind of sometimes joke about how sad I am that we have to design a program around things children used to normally do on their own. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for example, when I was little, even, even in a suburb, my mother would say, go outside and don't come back till the streetlights come on, you know, and just 
don't come in the house all summer long, you know, and even after school. And, um, and children were mostly unsupervised and they were out there and they were mixed ages and there was negotiating and problem solving. And they did all that on their own outdoors where, where, you know, the, the resources that outdoors have, the uneven surfaces and the climbing of the trees and all the risks and all the, that you have to do out there was so challenging for them. And now we're inside so much. And so we actually have to organize and people, there's, I think there's also fear of strangers that we went through in the eighties and things like that. And so people are just afraid to send their kids outside by themselves anymore. Um, and especially at early ages. So, you know, I sometimes joke about it's funny that we have to have an outdoor program to re reintroduce nature to yeah, another generation. To our children. And will you yeah. tell us a little bit of like what a day with your school might look like with the kids? Like what kind of things you yes. might do when you, and you always meet out on location, right? At some beautiful spot. Right. Yeah, definitely. You know, you can find nature locations anywhere. Um, you know, even in the big city, you can find them. I mean, we did in, in a, even in the city of Huntington Beach where we had our school, you know, there was still the, the butterfly park that we went to, if you remember. And that was a place where there was no playground. It was simply a butterfly fly preserve, but it, it gave the kids trees. It gave them bugs, nature, all of the things that are there just in this little tiny square foot area. So I encourage you to find those places. And I do, I do suggest finding the places that don't have the play structures and things like that, because there's this idea that once you're done with whatever the play structure has to offer, there's nothing else to do. At, mm -hmm. at least I've found that with young children a lot of the time. Uh, and so when you take them to an, a nature location and simply set out a blanket, um, they may be bored at first or not used to that, but pretty soon they figure out on their own what it is that they want to do or need to do. Uh, and, and it goes beautifully and without very much that the parent has to do. But in our school, we, the parents drop off. We have the first hour is either like acclimating to our location for that month um, or, you know, just greeting each other, getting to know each other, running around, seeing what's on the land. Um, or we are hiking to our classrooms, we call them. Mm -hmm. So depending on, we don't want the parents to have to hike too far out to drop off their kids. So we have a drop off location and we'll hike out to our classroom. When we get to our classroom, the children help set up, which is like laying out blankets, hanging up the backpack line. Um, sometimes, you know, we're, we're putting out snack, things like that, uh, getting our curriculum, which is really a backup plan to nature. Um, mm -hmm ready so it could be sewing or painting or all the normal preschool type things okay so and you do you have those kind of things like they're available but it's not necessarily like, not necessarily like okay time for sewing right it's exactly like you can come sew if you want you can come do this if you want but if they end up playing in nature the whole time totally yes great too. yeah absolutely uh -huh. yeah and that's why i call it our backup plan because the things uh -huh. that i plan and bring are really second to the dead animal we just found on the trail or the swing i hung in the tree or the water that's flowing over the rocks or the tadpoles that they found, that's all going to be first. And this is sort of like, you know, it, a backup plan. <laughs> so uh, how the best way yeah, to explain yeah. it. And um, I love so that it, you were mentioning if they might be bored at first. And I had to, I had to say that I quoted you over the years in our household that I learned <laughs> it's when we get bored that we start to get creative. Right. So mm -hmm. in my household with my kids, and it never was a conversation like it was. Now I never heard my kids say I'm bored, you know, mm -hmm. and, and it is, that is part of what's nice about giving kids that freedom to explore is they they don't it almost isn't even a concept sometimes to be bored. Yeah, they just get so used to just being in their moments. Right. And yeah, yeah finding definitely. Them. Yeah, I used to say boredom is the beginning of creativity, which again came from Bev Boz to give her credit. Um, but yeah, when my children say that to me, I'm like, yes, you're just about to come up with something yeah, really yeah. cool. Yeah. So I guess my kids must have said it a few times. Maybe they like uh -huh. you know, heard it on TV or something too. But yeah, right. but to always come back at them and say that. And it's true, even yeah. for us as adults, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so that yeah. Time in nature with that open space to explore with a few activities as a sub curriculum, mm -hmm. kind of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then. 
So then we have, you know, we'll have a circle time with songs and snack and things like that. Food is crucial to getting those basic needs met so that they can go and do hard things like forage creeks and climb trees and, you know, problem solve with other little people, you know, so food is important. Uh, and then, you know, so, you know, you can do that by just packing snacks, right? Um, and then, you know, I kind of just keep myself involved in something, you know, like I'm sanding a stick or I'm carving a stick with my knife, or I'm even just taking a plant and weaving it, you know, and braiding it and doing different things so that my hands are busy and they have something, if they're little, especially to model and they want, what are you doing? What are we doing? Or I'm finding a different plant. Like if there's acorns around you, you can use rocks to crack the acorns open and um, just doing something with my hands for them to model. Wow. Versus what else would it maybe an adult nearby be doing with their hands? Yeah, Probably right. On their phone, right? So exactly. That's really, a part of it, because I feel like what's cool mm-hmm. here is that parents who are listening and maybe thinking about ways they could create this for their kids in their communities, if you know they could be inspired by this, right? That's a good note for parents. If you're going to take your kids into nature, don't mm-hmm. step aside and be on your phone the whole time, right? Because yeah. You're modeling, right? Right. That level of presence. So if you, you know, if you can find that within yourself, put that phone away and. Mm -hmm. at you know model what it is to be engaged in your environment wow yeah you know the parents in my school are often saying that when they go on a hike with their kids or they go out to the classroom places that we have or even just other places in our in our area that our children are educating them about what the plants are and which ones they can eat and what they can do with this one and but I think you don't necessarily have to know that because when I started my forest school I was new to this area and I didn't know the local flora and fauna yes, and yeah. even the hazards really, which scares me a little bit now, <laughs> but um, you know, like, so, so you have to learn, you have to be willing to just be interested, just model that interest in this natural yes, world. And yes, you know, yeah. what does this look like? And what does that look like? And there's very few plants that you can't touch, you know, you're not going to want to ingest mm-hmm. anything, of course, mm-hmm. that you don't, that you don't know what it is, but I mean, you know, so get some field guides and, and just, just model your own learning out there yes. of what's out there. Yes. And then they'll like either come along. That, right. And that's such a great place for us to do that with our kids to model being out there and like, Oh, I wonder what that plan is called. And then you end up have, there's ways that you can find that out if you want mm-hmm. to. Right. And yeah. Yeah. yeah like when I see a bug I've never seen, I just flat down on the ground and just watch it and stare at it. I don't say a single word. I'm just interested in this bug. I have five kids next to me. Like, what are you looking at? You know, what yeah. is that? You know, and you're not trying to make it a lesson on beetles, right? Or or download all the information you think you yeah. can put in their brains about that, but or right. even letting them come up with ideas and mm-hmm. insights, right? And and just modeling Actually, that respect of like, wow, oh that yeah, you're right, maybe you know, yeah. right? Oh. I actually think it's really interesting that when you do have the knowledge, when you are a naturalist oftentimes naming that stuff for children, the learning ends and the exploration and the curiosity ends. It's like, oh, that's a beetle. Let's walk away. Like, what is this? Like, even like active listening, like we talked about in the preschool, you know, and saying to them when they ask, what is that? What is it? What is it doing? And just repeating back to them, you're wondering what it's doing. What is it doing? You know, what what yeah, kind of yeah. bug is that? I've never seen right. like that one before. Yeah, right. You don't um, have to answer it. That you, can you don't have to answer it. With it. Them, like, I wonder, you're right. That is, you know, yeah, right. To just right. with them. Um, exactly. Definitely. It's, it's even better, I think, than having the knowledge because it sort of allows for the discovery and the inquiry to continue, you know. Um, and and I love that. So, you know, oftentimes even when I know the answer of the questions they're asking, I will repeat back their questions to them, you know, and um, because I don't, I want them to discover it on their own and the name of it really doesn't matter much as, as what is this creature, you know, and where does it live and what does it do? And that stuff is, and it lives here on this land with us. That stuff is more important to me than the actual naming of the items. Right. So, <clears throat> yeah. And so, so many for a long-term um, learning, if we're like, think we're concerned about our kids retaining information, right? Mm-hmm. then I do mm-hmm. feel like they do retain things so much more when it's like that mm-hmm. and just natural and uh, right. even self-driven and allow for that growth. And, right. Instead of just answering the questions and downloading the mm-hmm. info. And yeah. Yeah. We don't have kind of that older fashion 
form of education almost, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's always going to be the um, adult human <laughs> directed and produced. Right, right. Yeah. And it's really just about, again, modeling that curiosity and that learning. Yeah. And you're frozen for a moment again, but I want to ask you another question when you're back. <laughs> I know Cross. Tracy's up, you're up in the mountains a little bit, so maybe it's it's mountain stream yard. <laughs> Am I there? Um, you're here. It was just a moment, okay. a moment of pause, but um oh, good. And just one thing I thought that you mentioned that I felt like I really did learn from you, which might seem important as part of this too, is I remember that when we, we used to have the classroom and the kids having their experience and there would be some parents in the room that you would help us remember that like right now if we, we can like choose to make this about their experience and not take it over with our adult conversation or mm -hmm. our um, adult energy even, right? So I think that right. could be interesting for parents to remember like if a couple moms right now feel comfortable to get together with their kids and go in nature, <clears throat> as moms to remember, you probably don't wanna spend the whole time like talking about COVID or, you know, like doing mm -hmm. your processing because it really right. does take over the kids' environment, you know, and it's mm -hmm. nice to like make that separate and yes. let it be, a little more about their having room to experience things. <laughs> with right, our, right. And, it, you know, we're out there. In, nature has always been healing for me, but definitely during this time period, it has been crucial to what I do. And, um, and without the children, I've still had to go out there, you know, yeah, and just yeah. be um, in those places and learning about sit spots and learning about you know, meditating outdoors and things like that. Um, and so when you do take your children out there, part of it, I would assume, is that because you do also agree that nature is a healing place, right? right? So yeah, if you then sit there and we all need to download with our friends, like uh -huh. I totally get that. And I, that's another thing where it was much easier for me to say when I wasn't a mom <laughs> and I finally got together with other adults and wanted to have adult conversation. I understand that completely. But yeah, when the kids run off to do something, maybe that's the time to da to have little conversations. And when they come back, to include them in what you're doing um, or to join them in what they're doing, you know. And it's so easy to just find a stick and get a rope, put up a swing, um, put out a blanket and find some plants and bring some magnifying glasses and field guides and you're set, you know, uh, especially for little ones. And, you yeah, know, I think yeah. most elementary ages, you know, and. I think if we're, if our children are, are spending a lot of time on screens, mm -hmm. finding one day a week that we can go and do that as sort of an antidote. You're so right. Really, you're, really so right. you're so right. Because I know, yeah, you're someone who's been talking and teaching about the dangers of screen time for years. And mm -hmm. so, right, yeah, to consider right now that our kids are absolutely getting more screen time than ever. That's yeah. an even better reason to incorporate nature into our curriculum. Right. Yeah. We, we, think, yeah. we think we have a curriculum. And but then, yeah, I love what you say as a parent, if you're going to go out there too, to let it be healing time for you as well. Right. Mm -hmm. And to to know you're going out there because it's good for all of you and to right. enjoy it like that. And, mm -hmm. and, then, and that part of that to me would include not trying to turn it into a lesson. Right. But instead. Right. Um, I don't know. Well, some of what I feel like you always modeled in your beautiful classrooms and still is what I've heard like in the unschooling world called strewing. Have you heard that term where you're just like strewing, like you're placing things around that they might in the, end up getting interested in, right? So yeah, like right. Like magnifying glasses or mm -hmm. the sewing or the whatever it might be, it's kind of like strewing the environment with things they might be interested in. Like in the preschool classroom, we had like the writing center, right? Yeah, you know, right. Nature things or just anything mm -hmm. that might engage them not because they have to do it so it's cool to realize you can do that with any age even yes. 17 year olds you could have you could strew things that you might yeah. like them to just mm -hmm. maybe come upon if they want to yeah <laughs> so, one of the yeah. things we often do in our school is build shelters so yeah. and you know that could be so if you're looking at different academics that could be so many different things right it could be indigenous culture cultures it could be building it could be you know physics, so many different things. And so we often just find logs and we're, you know, hauling them all over the place to support them on a, you know, a tree branch that's, that's more horizontal and we're, you know, whatever it is, we're finding other things to add on top, grass dried grasses or whatever it is and building different sorts of shelters. And that I just, I don't 
ask the kids to build a shelter. I just start building it, you know, awesome. and then they want to take over and they want to awesome. tell me how it should go. And then suddenly I'm in the background going, where does this one go? You know, and, and that's following their lead. Way to, that's, <laughs> it's so clear to say, I'm not going to say, come on, it's time to build the shelter. And I'm not right. even going to say, Hey, do you want to build a shelter? I'm just right. going to start playing with building a shelter and then they might mm -hmm. come over and what are you doing? I'm building a shelter. You want to help me? Yeah. <laughs> right. That's right. Such a fun way to teach. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, and when you're dealing with young children who are in that imitative phase, they always, there's always some that want to do whatever it is you're doing. Uh, so right. just, you know, it, if that's something that, like, you know, that I want to have this, you know, children really love private little spaces. And if you can remember your childhood, you know, a box or underneath the table or building a fort or doing all of those things. Well, in the natural world, you can have those places too, inside a bush or, you know, just stacking a bunch of logs over a tree. And then suddenly you feel like you've got your own little playhouse or your own little world. And mm. we, we sometimes will bring the whole, make it so big, we can bring the whole group in for lunch. And they just, it's just magical. You know, there's the magic in nature. And so I'm often building shelters because I love them so much. And I yeah. wish I had them when I was a kid, you know, so it's a passion of mine. Uh, but you can find out whatever your passion is. I know a lot of people out there have passion in medicinal plants, you know, and looking for those out on the trail. What are your local medicinal plants and making salve or, like I said, grinding acorns, which we then eventually make into pancakes and um, or just doing whatever interests you. I think if you can bring your passion out there, uh, they're going to join you in that, you know, and it, it can go, depending on the age of the child, it can go as far as that child wants it to go, you know, academically or otherwise. So, cause you can take, you know, grinding acorns into a whole lesson, right. Or, you know, books on, on the, the native people in that area and what they used acorns for, you know, or if they're interested in that. I love but and just, I remember uh, that you used to remind, you used to invite us as parents as part of your school community to, bring our passions into the community and to the kids. And right. in a sense, as parents too, that we might as well, if there's certain things we love, we can bring it again, not like mm -hmm. force it on our kids, but yeah. bring like for me, I love like journaling or anything that involves paper and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that might always be something I might bring, you know, right? Yeah. Just because I want it there, but right. to, to share with the kids. So it's, it just feels so much it seems so simple. It seems evolved, but very um, simple to remember that teaching can be about that. Really just like yeah. sharing what you want to share, being who you are, inviting them into what you're passionate about. <laughs> yeah, yes. it's, it's, I really think of teaching as more of in today's definitions, like a facilitator, yeah. you know, like yeah. you said, the strewing. I hadn't heard that term before, but that's exactly what it is we do. We place things out there. Um and have no attachment to it also, whether yeah, it gets yeah. used or not, you yeah. know, because, you know, it's not really, they know what they need. And I think that that's really important to understand when we're worried about young children's learning being delayed right now, you know, or having school been canceled and the, the distance learning isn't working. And is this idea that children don't know what they need to learn right now, what they need to know in life. And I think we can get really caught up in the idea that the adults know exactly what young children should be doing right now. When in reality, children know uh, what they need to do and what they, and you and I, I mean, like I'm not unschooling my children, my children are in school. So I don't even think of that as an unschooling concept is just a trust in the capability of young children. And the fact that they are always learning, you know, whether they're in a desk or not, or whether they're on the computer or not, um, and to just trust that and not, I'm hoping that parents can just trust that and not be so worried and see that, you know, being outdoors might be better than the, than the online version of school right now, right. you know? Yeah. And that's where, that's the, probably the downside of school having become a thing is that we started to think we need school for our kids to be learning. Right. So I mm -hmm. love that. Yeah. So many of these approaches that remind us that what learning can look like, like going outdoors for the day mm -hmm. can be absolutely educational and right. interesting, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. And healing and all, I mean, it meets us in all of our different areas of growth, which is, you know, it's become even since working in, in, at the preschool that, that your children were a part of, which was such a lovely, beautiful time in my life for sure. 
but I've even grown even further in understanding the benefits of nature, you know, bet, and for my Especially own nowadays. Health. Yep. We all need it more than ever. So yeah. anyways, we can get out there. I love, it really makes sense to me as you say that it is going to educate our children more holistically, right? Taking care of our emotions, physical, you know, wellness, mental stimulation, and even the energy of the whole thing. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's yeah, absolutely what we need. It's so exciting. So I'm so, yeah. I'm so thankful that you're someone who's just can really like showing what's possible mm -hmm. with kids and families and nature. <laughs> you know, I also Very think what, one thing we do at the end of our day after, you know, all the other wonderful yeah. things is yeah. we before lunch, we do a story and the stories are always, um, you know, once in a while, we'll read a book now and then and to older kids, you could be reading a chapter book, you know, each each day that you go out there, you could read a chapter. But we also just do storytelling, which I think is really a sort of a lost art form. And the idea of seeing the pictures on the walls of your head, whether you're two or 20 mm -hmm. is, is, is super important. And you know, some people will be like, well, I'm not a storyteller. But the truth is, is that we all have stories, uh -huh. right? We all have stories of our lives, of our childhood, and our children want and need connection even more than ever right now uh -huh. during COVID. Wow. And so remembering to tell your story, you know, whatever that might be, if it's if it's story of, I mean, my children in my school, their favorite stories are ones of me as a little girl and my children uh -huh. and the things that they do. And so they'll be like, tell us the story about Elijah cutting his foot, you know, over and over and over again. They want to hear this story of Elijah and when he cut his foot and what he said. And, you know, it's just a normal trip to the ER and stitches and all of that. But it's just fascinating to them. So, you know, it's about the age of your child. Of course, you're going to talk about more emotions and difficult relationships to a teenager, whereas for to a two year old, what they want to know is, is I is who cut their foot and when, because that's what's important to a little kid, right? You know, it's wow. pain yeah. and injury. Wow, but so. I love that you're bringing that up, that storytelling, because a lot of us think we know we want our kids to get that maybe through like making them read or write or write. Yeah. So mm -hmm. for you to bring it back to the core of like just storytelling, so that can mean you as a parent telling a story and really modeling what storytelling can be like. And even if it's the same story that they, for some reason, want to hear again and again, and then mm -hmm. I was remembering how you used to show us how with kids who, well, whatever age, you could be ready to dictate a story, right? If they were starting to tell something and you wanted to yeah. be writing it down for them. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's so many. Yeah, pa paper, and a, paper and a pen. And, and yeah, a lot of, especially with little, little children, I would tell a story about something that happened in my life. And I had this little boy for a year who literally told me a story about the same thing that happened in his life immediately after I told uh. the story about mine. And we would just write it down word for word and 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 dictate them. Yeah, so with littler ones and the older ones could write it and tell it, you know, and take turns telling stories to each other. Or, and, it, you know, it can, it, when, I, I just don't want parents to feel like they have to be an expert in order to go out there and educate their children, because I really don't think that's the case. And I think we're often made to feel that that's the case. And it doesn't have to be perfect. It just has to be you. If it was little, you know, three little pigs, because you heard it a million times when you were a kid, make it up. You don't have to know it word for word, you know, make up the parts you forgot. Yeah. Um, or like I said, the more powerful ones are the personal ones, you know? Even things that may not be seen as positive and we don't want, you know, like the struggles you had as a child or the time that you were teased or just any of that stuff. The most important thing that they are learning throughout school is the social interaction connection, right? Like if they don't have that stuff, whether they know their math skills or, you know, their chemistry properties and all that isn't really going to matter if they can't oh. interact with other children. Yes, so. and you can see that like storytelling and sharing stories is part of getting good at social interaction. Wow, that's right. little, that right. really makes sense. I mean, I can see that in my own life. Yeah. And, it, and, and I've even loved learning along the way that like conversation, right, is such an amazing way that we all learn, especially kids. So mm -hmm. every time we're having these conversations with our kids, there's so much mm -hmm. more going on. Yeah, absolutely. If you're being real with them and authentic and you don't have an agenda, you know, where of where the conversation's supposed to go and you just say, you know, hey, the one time I was riding my bike and I, you know, had a chain in my hand and 
chain got caught in the tire. I flipped over my handlebars and I got 16 stitches. Oh my gosh, that could be like an hour long conversation with a five year old. <laughs> uh -huh. So, you know, um, you yeah, know, and yeah. of course that's my expertise is early childhood. But even with my children who are 11 and eight, they still want to know they are, I have all of their attention when I start talking about me and things that happened with me and my siblings and how we fought and how we did this and that. And real life stuff is what they want to hear about because that's what they're in right now. Awesome. Right. They're in those times when that we were in. Um, and I think it just becomes really important to them to hear that we weren't always 40, 50 years old. <laughs> so, uh, yes, you know, and, and that's yeah. part of maybe what we can enjoy. If more of us are getting a lot more time with our kids to just yeah. see all the richness of what can be happening, especially mm -hmm. again, when we're doing what we at least even, even if it's what we barely can to mm -hmm. feel refreshed, to be present and enjoy those moments, yeah. right? Like that's yeah. certainly like you said, at the core of it, if you're exhausted mm -hmm. and burned out, it's hard to be functioning like that. So yeah. And you know, all the parents finding that time right? and totally. ways for themselves. Totally. I was, I was just there this morning and yesterday and the day before, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, like if I go back to, even with my 11 and eight year old, making it about play, right. Especially when, there's some sort of boundaries I need to hold or discipline of some sort, you know? Um, and you know, they were just, you know, they've been home for so long, they're leaving everything everywhere. Right. And it's like, I'm tripping over their stuff. And, um, and so I said, Oh guys, I have a story for you, which is right brained, right. Which was more, most young children lives in their right brain. So if you want to engage them, you have to play a game, sing a song, tell a story. Ah. They need, they need to be living in that. That's why Play is the only way they learn when you brought your other Kristen on and she was yeah, talking about yeah. play. It's because the right brain is where it's most developed and it's where they learn. The left brain is the logical portion of the brain and they're not there yet, oh. you know? And so they'll get there slowly, but they have to, they have to get it through the right brain right now to really reach them. And so I just sat down and I was like, imagine that, you know, and I basically made them me and my and my husband and I made my husband me and them from watching all those <laughs> funny funny videos on Facebook and things like that where the adults act like children I said and imagine your planes you know Stratomatic is my son's favorite game right now it's a statistics baseball thing and, uh -huh. I said, and imagine that I'm dropping stuff on top of it and then I step on it and then I walk over this and you know and and uh and daddy hits me and I scream my head off and you know like just all this different uh -huh. stuff and I mean, they were just like eyes big, hilarious laughing, ah. you know, and it's, you know, I, I, you just sort of relate to that. And I, instead of lecturing them, I was a brilliant moment, but you know, I <laughs> often lecture too, but I was like, go back to the right brain, you know, and I, it, it, they were able to understand so much of what I was trying to say, you know, of, um, I need your help right now. <laughs> you know? like, yeah. Right. Yeah. Please don't make it hard for me to do what I need to do to take care of me, you know? Right, right. Um, and to find like a respectable way to say that. Right. They will hear and they will respond to, right? Versus lecturing right. them or yelling at them or all these right. ways we might express. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, or even just something simple like, you know, my, I need to brush their teeth and it's the end of a long day. And, you know, if I say to my even eight year old now, like he likes to play mama and baby bear. Um, and if I just say little bear time to brush your teeth, he's in the bathroom like that. And we're playing the brushing the teeth game and he's a little bear climbing up on the sink, even at eight. Um, it's something that's worked since he was very little. But if I were to say Jonah's trying to brush your teeth, Jonah's trying to brush your teeth, Jonah's trying to brush your teeth over and over and over again, he would completely ignore me, you know, like he just wouldn't come. That's so, so exciting. I didn't, I didn't know that about how play it, it engages the right side right brain and yeah right and hemisphere for the, the brain. children mm -hmm. and that's what yeah really what's working for them so that yeah makes it makes your life a lot easier during those really hard times if you can understand a little bit of where children live um in the moment which they have so much to teach us that way right i mean that's right. so much that's to teach us about the, the moment. Gift with our kids which i feel like you're so good at wow mm -hmm. i have a i think a lot more in the background but <laughs> and i guess we've, we've got it's now been about 40 yeah. minutes. So um, yeah. I guess you can start to call it to a close, but will you yes. say again how people could follow you or um, be receiving any input from you? At least yeah. website name? Yeah, it's acornvillage.org. So just as they are, acornvillage.org. And um, you can reach me at tracy at acornvillage.org. 
and I'm happy to answer questions and be of support. Not that I know at all, because I definitely don't. We're all in it together, right? So I was telling you before we started that I was a little nervous because of this desire to help during such a difficult time for so many people, but right, not having right. all the answers, of course. Yeah. But, right. Yeah. Just sharing and if this could be of help. So yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. And yeah. Um, yeah, I hope this is helpful. I'm sure it's been helpful to anybody who tunes in. So yeah. I love you and I appreciate it. Love you too. <laughs> okay. All right. Let's talk to you later. Okay. <laughs> Goodbye to Bye. you. Bye to y'all for being here. Thanks. <laughs>